her as she serves our nation and pray for them as they're apart. And uh, this morning I'm going to do that even before you start. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Justin and Bailey. We thank you for their lives. We thank you, Lord, for the call upon them. We pray now, Lord, that you would be with them in their marriage. Father, um, you strengthen all things. So, Lord, even when they have to be apart, I pray that you would strengthen their love, strengthen their trust, strengthen them completely. May their marriage be strong. Father, I pray that you would keep Bailey protected, watch over her. And, Lord, I pray that on the days when she's lonesome that you would be her rock and fortress. And on the days when Justin is really missing her, be his rock and fortress. You are wonderful. You have called them together. You have called them into ministry. And, Lord, we just pray your richest blessing upon them. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Good morning. I'd like to. Oh. oh. Am I good now? Cool. Um, I would like to begin with uh, another prayer. Uh, so let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us this day where we can gather together with you, praise you, and hear what you have to say. Lord, I understand that there are many things that we are carrying as we entered this building today. I ask that you lift these burdens off of us and that you give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts and minds to understand. I ask that your words will not, that my words will not be my own, but yours, Lord. I ask this in your name. Amen. So before uh, I dive into the passage, I'm going to catch us up to speed of what's happened so far in the book of Joshua. Um, so in the first chapter, Moses has died and God has anointed Joshua to lead the Israelites. Um, and then in chapter 2, there were spies sent into Jericho and Rahab protected them from the king of Jericho. And then God dried up the Jordan River and allowed the Israelites to cross and they made a second covenant with God and if you were at uh, district assembly yesterday Dr. Busick explained exactly what that covenant was um, but with a different person uh, making that covenant and that brings us to today's text um, it's in Joshua 5 13, verses 13 through 15 Verse 13, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So, essentially, the Israelite army just crossed in, into Jericho. They were in Jericho's fields, and... God gave them that land, but uh, I don't know if Jericho necessarily recognized that. Um, I don't know. If someone came up to my apartment and said, I'm, I'm moving in today, um, I'm like, uh, no, I, I pay for this apartment. This is my apartment. Um, and so I don't know if they necessarily recognize it the same way as we wouldn't. Um, and Joshua finds a random dude in a field with his sword and draw, sword drawn. So it's fair to assume that this guy would not be happy to have them in his fields. Um, and despite this, Joshua did the unexpected and asked which side he was on. It would have been fair 
to assume this guy was an enemy. And uh, it would have also been fair to not give him a chance to swing at him. Um, he could have, Joshua could have tried to defeat this guy. But instead, he reflected God's love and gave him an opportunity to show who he was and what he stood for. And this is like back in the Bible times. No one's really going to be standing out and swinging a sword around, have it drawn at least. So like, how is this applicable to us? Well, sometimes in our lives, it's easy to assume people are our enemies and want to defend ourselves, right? Especially when all the signs are pointing that they mean us harm. For example, um, as mentioned before, I grew up in this church. I grew up in Weston. Um, and so, of course, I love the Chiefs, right? Um, so, obviously, if I'm out and about in Olathe and I see someone wearing Raiders merch, uh, they're bad, right? <laughs> now, well, they might be supporting the wrong team and maybe a little messed up, we're still commanded to reflect God's love on them. And this can be found in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, with the two greatest commandments, being love yourself, loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and loving your neighbor as yourself. It's easy to point fingers at society and say that, well, we're in the church, we're Christians, we're not a part of that. But we do this in the big C, the church body too, judging people and not reflecting God's love as we're supposed to. And not necessarily in this big C body church community, um, but in my experience, I've gone to a bunch of different churches, and um, if you can't tell, I have tattoos, and I've gotten quite a few dirty looks, and uh, some rude comments, um, but I've also overheard and caught myself in conversations, and I was like, asked, was that seriously said? Is this what God planned for this institution? And deep down, what is concerned in society with politics or nitpicky things, it's it's not worth arguing about. Discussing about it and having a constructive conversation about it is different. But not everybody's agree going to agree on everything. However, there is one thing, at least, that the church will agree on, and that's what our mission is. We're not... Uh, our mission, deep down at the base of it, is to serve God. We're not serving society and its goals. We are serving God, and we serve God by reflecting the love that God showed us. So continuing on, in verse 14, the commander in the field with his sword drawn, waving around, uh, was asked uh, who you're for, and he answers that he was for neither. He wasn't for Jericho. He wasn't for Israel. But how can this be, right? Obviously, Israel is backed by God. So obviously, he should be for Israel, right? But it's because he was for God, not for the nation of Israel. A passage that helped me recently with kind of making sense of this is Matthew 12, 20 through, 22 through 28, starting with verse 22. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind, mute, and he healed him, so that a blind and mute man both spoke and saw. All the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons, except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. 
But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom is divided against itself, is brought to desolation. And every city of house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's a divided against himself. How then will this kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has came upon you. So yes, this is a story about Jesus casting out demons from someone. But there's a bigger idea in it, which is you can't be both for one side and another. You can't be for nation and for God. One has to be higher. So how, how does this apply? Well, I'm a chaplain candidate in the army. And my job is to be a moral advisor to my commander. Me and my commander are buddies. Uh, we get along and I help advise him. Um, and while country is involved in there, it's going to change over time. And if it comes between doing what my country wants and if it doesn't align with what God wants, then I have to choose God because God never changes. Of course, this isn't just regulated to our outer influences, is it? So there I was. Okay, so a little brief. When I say, so there I was, you say, so there you were back. So there I was. Uh, it was, I was in my apartment. It was after finals week. Um, I just wrapped up a couple finals and I was relaxing on my couch. And uh, the weekend before this, um, I had drills, so I had taken care of all my soldiers, no problems, right? Uh, I was about to boot up my Xbox and dive deep into one of my favorite story games. Um, anybody here like story games? You? Yeah. Good. Uh, so it's like digital monopoly. Um, kind of. A little bit more deeper than that. But uh, I was about to boot up my favorite story game and get like distracted by that for the rest of the night. And um, I got a weird phone call. And usually I get a bunch of scam calls, like three or four a day at least. Um, but this one was a little different, and I was like, eh, I don't really want to answer it. But uh, I was like, eh, just for funsies, I'll answer it, and just if it's a scam, close, and then back to the video games, right? Well, I answered it, and it turned out to be a first sergeant um, from a different battalion. So for those who aren't familiar with military or any of that, uh, first sergeant is the second to highest uh, non-commissioned officer, which is a whole bunch. They're the second to highest person on the enlisted side uh, in the level of military I'm in right now. And so it's not necessarily a good thing to get a call from the first sergeant. Something's very wrong. Um, and so uh, I asked what was happening, and he told me that a soldier from my battalion called one of his soldiers in his battalion, and um, that my soldier was having suicidal ideations. And that they wanted to talk to a chaplain. And so I got the information I needed from him. I asked him if I had a little bit of time because this is a really serious issue. This isn't something that I take lightly and it's not something that I want to mess up because there's serious consequences if it isn't taken care of properly. And he said that there was, uh, I had some time that they were still on the phone with his soldier and that uh, to, he'll let me know when to call. 
And so I called all the other chaplains in my phone that I had, and I, none of them sadly picked up. Um, it's a conversation I'll have with them in September. <laughs> but I realized at this point I was the best option. And so what I did was I called my chaplain's assistant, and luckily she picked up. And uh, I asked her to get the resources um, for uh, essentially counseling, professional counseling, uh, therapy and stuff that we have through the Army. And then I called the soldier. Well, good news. Um, the soldier, we got him all the resources he needed. He's doing great. Uh, he even found Christ and is searching for a church right now. Um, yet, in this story, I wasn't the one that saved the day. I was not the hero in this story. If you noticed, I wasn't confident in this. I asked for time. I called the other chaplains, trying to see if they could take care of it. And I was actually scared. Like, yes, this is a big deal, and it should be taken seriously. Um, but I tried to get out of it, kind of. Even for moments, I let my fear in between myself and God. And even though on easy days, I full force said before this, that this is what I'm called to do, and this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to help soldiers. Now, this is kind of a downer, but let me encourage you here. Even if you fail, even if you let something between you and God, that God will always accept you back. God will always have the ability to use you still. And you will always be able to reflect the love of God. Moving on to the last verse, uh, the commander says to Joshua to take off his shoes, that this is holy ground, um, this is seen a couple times at least in the Bible, uh, seen in, with Moses and the burning bush. Now it's moving on to Joshua. Um, and I can't necessarily stop you from removing shoes in here. Some people might even tell you, hey, you got to keep them on, your feet stink. Um, and the little C church, so this building here, uh, can be seen as holy ground, but the Big C Church itself, the body that I've mentioned a couple times, is set apart. Or another word could be holy. God resides in the Big C Church body, not necessarily these walls. As said before, this um, grew up in this church. This church was built in like 2004-ish. Okay. Um, and I actually was helping build this church by running around and distracting everybody from doing their jobs. <laughs> the, the point here is to remember, remember that God resides in you and not these walls. Now, when you leave, God leaves with you. So in a moment, uh, we will be participating in communion. Um, I'm going to invite you to come down the right aisle. Um, but in the Nazarene Church, we practice an open table. So anyone who's following Jesus can actively participate.